Okay, this uh, brand new release, Tony Banks, 18 Pieces for Orchestra, a wonderful little box that is now available to buy. Uh, there is, of course, a purchasing link uh, just below this video. Uh, my first question really is when Michael Winner asked you to score um, The Wicked Lady, was that the first time you'd worked with an orchestra? And what are the pitfalls of trying to get what you want from a large selection of musicians? Is it like trying to push jelly uphill? Well, it's kind of different. Or the, the thing with Michael Winner, um, yes, I mean, it was always going to be, uh, I was always going to have to have help with that. It was the first time I'd ever sort of thought, ever been asked to do anything with an orchestra. I had this theme that Michael liked a lot. And um, and he got me in touch with this guy, Christopher Palmer, who was a, a ranger and a film composer in his own right at the time. And and he he worked on on it. I mean, I gave him lots of bits of pieces to you know writing with the piano and everything. And then he he orchestrated it all. And I thought the orchestrations he did, particularly of of the the main theme, were, were really interesting. You know, he made what was, I thought was a fairly well, it was a nice theme, but it wasn't. You know, he made it sound a lot better than it originally was, which was was quite something. So, I mean, that's why I sort of kept in the back of my mind the idea that it might be nice to try something a long time in the future. But you know, I I, I didn't really know. It was just sort of something that when the um, you know, the Genesis sort of, uh, when we did the Calling All Stations tour that, you know, that kind of ended, if you like, I thought, well, do I stop or do I carry on? And I thought, well, I've always wanted to try this. So let's, let's give it a go. And you asked how, if it's different, I mean, it, it's, yeah. I mean, particularly when I first started, it was, it was really weird because it was, um, you know, I, I had help from a, a ranger called Simon Hale the first time who was, who was very helpful and stuff, but trying to get an orchestra to do what you want <laughs> is quite tricky. Um, they're a bit, yeah, I have to be honest, the first time the first orchestra was not terribly enthusiastic. They were prepared to do it, and one or two people in it were great, but it was just uh, um, very difficult. And the first sessions I did, actually, I uh, didn't work at all. I mean, I spent, I spent a couple of days in the studio at Abbey Road, and after I finished that, I thought, I, I'm gonna, not going to do this. I can't face it. It's just, it's, it sounded, I think it sounded awful, and it was very difficult. Um, then I was persuaded to get back in again with a different uh, um conductor, a guy called Mike Dixon, who who sort of worked with, he he worked both sides of the fence, if you like, and and it started to become much easier. And we tried to make certain we went in the studio with everything more prepared. That was the thing I didn't understand. When you go into studio with a an orchestra, they kind of um you spend an awful lot of the time sort of like making certain the scores are all right and everything. And then you've got to try and get across roughly how what you want to do in terms of tempo, everything. I mean it really and after you know, after one session, you're supposed to have a piece done, and it was it was it was very. I found it very tricky, but uh, in those first days, and I learned a lot about how to do it better. I felt the next two times. But having said that, I thought the first one turned out, you know, particularly the slower pieces turned out really well. Yeah. well I've sort of heard so many reports of bands that uh, found it incredibly difficult to work with orchestras. Pink Floyd uh, doing Atom Heart Mother, I think Deep Purple in 1969, 1970. Uh, do you think the orchestras are generally quite sniffy about working with musicians that they deem as coming from a pop or, or, or a rock background? Yeah, well, I think that the, the, the slight difference between working this way, where I was working, was just the orchestra. I wasn't trying mm -hmm. to, you know, it wasn't with the band. I think working with a band is quite difficult. We have, you know, the whole nature of rock music has a very different um, attitude, sensibility when it comes to uh, rhythm. Um, you know, we, we do certain things that are almost impossible to write in, in, in a score, you know, in terms of all those pushes, advanced beats and, and syncopation, every kind that you do so naturally as a rock musician. A lot of classical musicians don't find it very natural. Um, mm. But I think more and more are. And I think the more they work in sort of film music and everything, which is more hybrid, um, they get used to that. Uh, and I think, you know, when I had did the first one, I did have a struggle with that to try and get some of the rhythmic elements across was actually I, much more difficult than I thought it was going to be. I didn't think that would be a problem. And even to get the sort of the players to play the actual, you know, some of the things that seemed fairly, I would have thought very difficult for a good, you know, good player to play, they found difficult. Um, which was why I then decided that I needed to to, to approach the thing differently. And I went to uh, to Prague to, for the, both the next records with different orchestras as it happened. But they were well used to working with, um, you know, with film things. Also, you could get about 10 times the time out of them. Um, so you could do a lot more rehearsal. Um, and they had no objections to things like double tracking, which was proved to be a little bit of a, you couldn't do in England, you'd have a lot of trouble with that. I mean, I didn't want to do it and I was accused of doing it and that was a bit of a problem. But um, so, you know, that was kind of such a relief, really. But having done it once, I went in the second time with it a lot more um, 
uh, organized, you know, so I, the, we tried to get everything so that we got rid of all the bum notes and the scores for a start, a much clearer idea of uh, how it should sound. Also, I want I used Paul Englishby, who's a very fine arranger composer in his own right, as the conductor as well. And that helped a lot because he, you know, we'd worked out beforehand exactly what we were going to do, really. And it was much, much smoother and much easier way of doing it. Um, so that, that was a much happier happier result for me both both doing it and 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 the way you know it's just the way it came out um you know it was i think it was more consistently good than the first record which was you know had some i say there's some really good moments for me on it but uh, a couple which didn't work so well okay i mean you talked about the the translation of bring uh, with between rock music and classical music um i always felt there was a, a pastoral hymnal tradition evident in early genesis uh does that tradition still shape your musical vision and ambition regarding your classical work? Well, I mean, I think the same motives are there. I've just a bit more freedom sometimes with the orchestra, orchestral stuff because, I mean, you know, the nature of, uh, of well, for a start, with uh, when I was doing stuff with Genesis, it, you know, had to please the other other members of the band, <laughs> um, <laughs> which was, you know, sometimes easy, but they they got a bit fed up with my, my diminished chords kind of got to them sometimes, particularly in later days. So I could do what I liked in that sense. Uh, and I, I mean, I, my nature, my what I love, I like to do things a little bit unusually in the sense I like to use slightly unusual harmonies uh, with chords and melody lines, and I like to avoid repetition if I can probably too much in my case, actually. So within the group, though, you tended to try and get um, a degree of repetition in there because that sort of it sort of, sort of worked better with a rock song than it does. But with classical stuff, you can orchestral music, you can you can let it develop more. And you, when you come back to the piece the second time, you can do it rather differently and all the rest of it. I just felt very free doing that. Um, I didn't feel any constraints in terms of composition. Mm -hmm. uh, so no term, constraint in terms of I mean, I, I do sort of you know, dance around the keys a little bit, which sometimes um, you know, some people, yeah, I mean, I think it all sounds natural, but you know, I, I you couldn't, couldn't say that I have written anything in sort of like, you know, it's not like, um, you know, a, a symphony in C major, if you like, for example, where people tend to stick around the same key to some extent, I, I do tend to float around and in terms of, um, time signatures and stuff a little bit too, and move around a bit. I, I, I just do what comes naturally to me without feeling any constraint. And, you know, sometimes you, you know, sometimes you may go a little too far that way, I suppose, but a lot of the time it sounds just sounds very natural to me. Yeah, yeah. You talk about um, um, working with other musicians. I mean, you said in the liner notes to to this wonderful box set. I'm quoting. I was always interested in trying to do something that's not been done before. Of course, within Genesis, the others are always trying to pull me back a bit from that. <laughs> sometimes, I'm interested. When do you think your vision of a piece was hindered by the musicians you worked with? Uh, that's a little. I, I don't think it was particularly. I mean, I, I needed constraining, to be honest. You know. Huh. Um, sometimes I do tend to go a little bit too far. Um, I just think in terms, well, I mentioned sometimes the chords go a little bit too kind of fancy for them. You know, the trouble is that the keyboard players have got 10 fingers and they like to sort of put them all down at the same time and maybe even hit two notes with one one thumb, you know. Uh, so you always find keyboard players tend to use a lot of major sevenths and, and all the rest of it, whereas key guitarists are much more um, inclined to use straighter chords. And I mean, the guitar does sound really good. Just play an E major chord on a guitar, it always sounds fantastic, you know, big, big thump, you know, whereas if we play it on a keyboard, it just sounds like an E major chord. Um, so, and I mean, I, I liked that. And as I, I did in my time, write a few things on guitar, particularly in the early days of Genesis, mm -hmm. because it was, a, you know, it was a different kind of thing and simplicity of a different kind. It made you do different things. And half the time I didn't know quite what I was doing, but often the open strings tended to lead you into certain chords and stuff, you know, which, which I used to quite like. So... It was a, um, I, it was more restricted way of working, but I quite like that sometimes. You know, with with the keyboard, you you really can do anything at any point. There's nothing really stopping you, um, just just doing anything. You know, and, and I sometimes yeah. need that. And I think I needed. You know, there's no doubt. That Mike was quite good at sort of picking out bits of you know, I'm playing along, and he's then he said, "Well, what was that? That was really good." You know, mm -hmm. and you know, I'd forgotten it already, but then we'd go back and listen to it, and it sounded all right. We worked on it, so that was quite useful. Um, uh, but that was in later days of Genesis. A lot of the earlier stuff of Genesis, I suppose, one tended to often one person would carry through an idea a very long way. Um, and I mean, I like doing that as well, obviously, you know, with things like the, the fifth and one for the vinyl and all that, you know, where you sort of have ideas that you stick to really and and and, and that works as well. Yeah. Um, how big of an influence were bands like um bands like the Beatles and the Beach Boys on your musical development and melodic sensibility? And uh, were you surprised when John Lennon said Genesis were heirs to the Beatles? I've never heard him say that. Well, there you go. If you said that's very nice. No, I, I to me, 
we were very ter- we loved the Beatles, you know, that simplicity, but with sophistication. I mean, they did a lot of things for the first time, you know, that I think, because when you heard I love pop music from the age of, you know, particularly about you know, 10 or 11. Um, and then when the Beatles came in, they did some unusual things. You know, you listen to a song like From Me To You, that kind of just a very slight key change in, in the middle eight, which reverses all the chords. Yeah. Uh, you know, it reverses what, what key you're in, and then it comes back out of it again. And that was, to me, I loved that, because that was just sort of, you know, it really worked for me. And it, it, it heightened both both parts of the song. Uh, and so, you know, we got sort of, I suppose, you just listen to stuff, and they did so many marvellous pieces, as in the Beach Boys, I think, were very experimental. Group, particularly in, in the in the in the Pet Sounds era. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. Brian Wilson was doing extraordinary things. Yes. Uh, and you listen in melodically the way they were going. I think influenced perhaps to some extent by sort of show tunes, Richard Rogers, who's another person I admire a lot. Uh, and Burt Backrack and you know, lots of people like that. I, I loved all the 60s groups, you know, zombies, kinks, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it developed from that, I suppose. And I think what we Having initially done a, a record, you know, where we were trying perhaps to write songs in that genre and have a success and not succeeding, perhaps, um, we decided, you know, well, not decided, we just felt we wanted to try and go a bit further, really. And with the, the groups had started to show the way, like the Beatles, Late Beat, you know, the Sgt. Pepper and Pet Sounds and things. And then also groups like Procol Harum and Family and Fairport Convention were showing you could you could take them um, it a little bit further. And we wanted to try a bit of that, really, you know, using slightly different chord sequences, less repetition, uh, more experimental lyrics and everything like that. And and I think that sort of really turned us on, and we we sort of went quite deep into that uh, in the, in that period, you know, for, of the early seventies. And I think we re- we really enjoyed that, and very, you know, it's produced some you know, for me some very exciting moments. You know, the sort of the final sort of seven or eight minutes of Supper's Ready, I think, is 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 really moving moving stuff. You know, and uh, I'm I'm very proud of that. Yeah, I mean, um, was your interest in working with orchestras at all wetted by the sonic possibilities are thrown up by? The use of the mellotron in some respects and uh what happened to that king crimson mellotron and are you a big fan of mike pinder <laughs> there's a lot of questions there a lot of questions <laughs> i can't remember all the questions i remember the middle one about the the, the mellotron we kind of lost it some we it, it's got sent away to be mended and it ended up in two parts and some guy ended up with one part he said i've got part of it where's the other part and i didn't know and it's just i don't know where it's gone and that came from, as you say, from uh, well, it's King, one of King Crimson, sir. Yeah. But he was the second part was Mike Pinder. Well, back in the early days, I loved Mike Pinder. I loved it. What well, I loved it. Go now. It was just, just I thought it was a wonderful piece of music, uh, and I really enjoyed that. And I think, you know, what they tried to do after that. Sometimes it was uh, Moody Blues, kind of hit and miss for a bit for me. Really, sometimes it was lovely, and other times it just seemed a bit banal. Um, but I think you know Pinder's stuff was was good in those early days in particular. But uh, you know I'm not I wouldn't say I was he wasn't really a massive influence on me because uh, on the days of future past obviously orchestra was very separate from the uh, we didn't at the time we thought it was all mellotron thought brilliant you know but then we realised in fact it was an orchestra with uh, a bit of mellotron thrown in there. Um, so the, the mellotron was a significant instrument in terms you talked that was the first part of your question. Mm-hmm. Wasn't it? Um, well, I love the sound of the strings. And when it came in, you know, it just it gave a sort of whole new element, having had just organ and piano at the, up to that point, really. And it was a wonderful thing. So the beginning of Watch of the Skies, you know, you had this sort of mixture of brass and, and strings and sort of rather nicely out of tune <laughs> with a sort of bass pedal going. And, and, and I love that kind of sound. And that's very orchestral, if you like. It's an orchestral sort of, uh, you know, chord sequence and everything. So, yes, it was a part of the thing. I think within the group, it was one of my roles was to kind of orchestrate the music a little bit, which included using the instruments like the, the Mellotron and, and obviously later on all the synthesizers and everything like that. So that was part of what I wanted to do. I like the way you can interweave melodies and all the rest of it. And so working with an orchestra was like that. Um, I, I don't know. You sort of, it's a bit of an either or thing, isn't it, though? You work with a group or you work with an orchestra. I mean, I, I, like, I like both sounds, sort of, and you get sort of some hybrid stuff. There is some hybrid stuff in, in films and stuff, and I quite like that. But it's uh, it's it's quite a difficult line to walk, I think, that. But Mellotrons have got a reputation uh, for being temperamental, shall we say. Uh, were there any um, uh, catastrophes uh, trying to use the Mellotron in the live forum for you? Any uh, problems with it? Uh, every night, um, <laughs> we had a problem with that thing. It was horrible. Um, every time you put your hands in, you weren't quite sure what was going to happen. And because it was a sort of, I don't know if you know, I mean, you 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 know, but not the audience may not all know about the uh, 
the, the way it was constructed with all these loop tapes of loop, the loops of tape, and uh, they're all on one, all the sounds were on kind of one, each note had its own uh, loop. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was kind of there was continuous loop, so that, you know one one thing could get stuck and another one could get there. And now you press it sometimes, and then a note would get stuck, and then so you get one note going and it would stop, and then you'd play the chord, and only about three notes were working. And sometimes the whole thing would just go ooh, 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 like this, and you didn't know what was going on. Um, I don't know. I remember I used to have nightmares around that time of going on stage with just a Mellotron <laughs> and trying to play the whole set. Um, because the other thing you couldn't do with the Mellotron was play fast on it. I mean, it just it didn't do anything if you played fast on it. You had to play pretty slowly in order to let the, you know, the heads, uh, the, yeah. the whole thing engage. So, no, I hated it, but I love the sound, you know, and that's why we had it. The, the, the smaller Mellotron that came later was a little bit more sophisticated. There's more you could do with it, but it was um, still a bit temperamental. But when the synthesizers came out and the, the closer they got to be able to, well, particularly obviously the sampling synthesizers, which could, could you know, simulate strings and everything uh, very well. I, I did switch to that. You couldn't go quite get that nice out of tune quality that you got on the Mellotron, but <laughs> sometimes, you know, it was, it was a price worth paying. Mm -hmm. But what would uh, Strawberry Fields be be like without the Mellotron? Well, that's right. And <laughs> Bungalow Bill, of course. We didn't realize, it's only when you first get up, first played the Mellotron, you realize that little bit at the beginning, which you thought suddenly George Harrison had developed a technique we didn't know he had. And you realize it was actually just one stop mm -hmm. on the Mellotron. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Strawberry Fields and, and and that the sort of it's a wonderful quality of sound that it creates. And 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 the Beatles, you know, given it was the sort of first time out for all that stuff, they did a very good job. I mean, it's amazing how it how it worked. I mean, obviously, I know that there's George Martin and everything was there. It was probably helped and stuff to make it sound because on its it's a pretty coarse sound on its own. You really do need to give it a bit of bit of magic to make it work. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, a uh, music historian, Wayne Studder, I don't know if I'm uh, pronouncing his name correctly, uh, referred to you as the most tasteful keyboardist in prog rock. Uh, to what extent do you agree? And in this context, uh, what is your opinion of Richard Wright as a musician? Well, tasteful. I'm, 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 who, who minds being called tasteful? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know really. I mean, I, t I try to sort of do everything so that it fits with, uh, fits with the music. I'm not really... I mean, I know I was accused at one point of doing too many solos and stuff, but I, everything I did was trying to sort of, um, you know, to enhance the sort of the song, if you like. And my main main role was to make, hopefully, try and make the singer sound good. I mean, that's that's yeah. what your role is there. You know, you you play stuff behind him and and make it work, I suppose. Um, well, Richard Wright in the early days of, of Pink Floyd. Um, I mean, I loved those early early songs of Pink Floyd. You know, the sort yeah. of uh, the Sid Barrett era. What well, that era, yeah, and which in a sense almost I think Rick Wright, Richard Wright was more of a um significant in that area in a way you know he was required to do more than hold down a chord i think mm -hmm. um i i you know later pink floyd i mean i i like it without loving it you know i'm sort of it's sort of i, I do find it just send me to sleep slightly but i mean it's, it's it's lovely music you know but it's just doesn't excite me in the same way as we talked about the beatles and all the rest of it earlier on you know that that's more my kind of thing um but uh yeah so he was you know he wasn't a particular influence i think i was more influenced by people like back in the 60s. I mean, Alan Price, I used to love. When I first heard House of the Rising Sun and that, and that solo, you know, uh, was just magic, I think. And another one I loved from that era was Rod Argent uh, with the zombies in particular. Um, and there's a song called When If Ever You're Ready, which was, wasn't really a very big hit over here, but it has a keyboard solo in the middle of it. And I was only about, I suppose, quite young when this happened. I used to just lift up the the thing and just play it again and again and again, because I just loved it. I hear it now and I think, well, it's actually, it's good, but it's you know, I don't know why it really hit me at the time and really influenced me, I think, in terms of a certain approach to to uh, to playing, uh, you know, when I was trying to do solos and stuff. And so th those people were important. And obviously the early Keith Emerson, when he was with the Nice, was was another very big influence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was never quite so keen on ELP. I find it a bit, bit over the top. But the Nice, you know, it just was so exciting. I was just, you know, that's something that always lives with me. And, and he was he was brilliant. Mm. John Peel famously said, uh, he said he never forgave Keith Emerson uh, for, Lee, for when the nice transmogrified horribly into uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer or something like that, that uh, ELP said were a waste of talent and electricity. <laughs> well, he, he loved to say things like that. I don't think he was that keen on the nice either. Um, I mean, I don't know if we had any own experience that John Peel was. We played a, a, an early show at a, a gig called the Hobbit's Garden mm -hmm. uh, in Wimbledon. And we we were actually, I think it was two of us on the bill, it was Roxy Music and us were on the bill together. 
Uh, it was Roxy Music's first show, even actually. It was very early days for us, when neither of us were kind of what you might call headliners. Mm -hmm. And we heard that John Peel was coming down. We were excited by that because thought, well, you know, oh, that would be good. Um, and he stayed for Roxy Music set. And then uh, when we started, he went, went home. <laughs> <laughs> so that told you all you need to know about uh, his attitude to us, really. And, yes. and I think prog music. I mean, you know, his favorite so of a song was that. Uh, what was it called? The Undertone song. I can't what it's called now. Teenage um, Kick. Teenage Kick. You know, it's a good pop song, but for your favorite ever, I don't know. You know, it seems to me to if you're on the music to that extent, it's it's a it's a strange choice. But there you go. Well, he, he certainly championed uh, punk, um, a new wave, of course. Um, punk was seen as a, a rejection of what m one might consider the the precious classical sensibilities of progressive rock. How did the punk revolution affect you, and do you feel it was something that needed to happen? I think there's any problem really. I mean, it's just something people wanted to, you know, we were perhaps, there was a lot of musicality, if you like, I suppose, with groups like like us and everyone, and, and people you know, wanted the ability to go back to just playing, you know, straight ahead stuff. And I, I have no problem with that. Uh, what did it do for us? I think it did a lot for us. It flushed all the other groups out of existence, actually. Um, you know, yes, ELP, all of them, they disappeared, and we were left the last one standing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we put out uh, at the time, Wind and Wuthering, which was probably our, one of our most proggy of prog albums that we ever did you know and it did pretty well so i think we were lucky in that sense we were very lucky also that the following album we had uh the hit with follow you follow me that kind of yeah. took us you know it gave us a kind of road if you like and and you know we were able to survive i think um uh, and whereas some of these other groups well some of them came back but they a lot of them didn't come back after that period of time i mean i had no problem with you know i actually i always rather like the song pretty vacant i thought it was a pretty good rock song actually but i mean i you know i wasn't crazy about the way that it was sung but it was a good the riff and everything was great mm -hmm. so I, I don't mind that um you know people like we've never really been flavor of the month at any stage in pop music so you know, it was other people, you know, or the members new wave after that. I don't know what it was. I had no idea. But we sort of seemed to carry on regardless mm -hmm. without getting much press, but but still selling lots of records. So we were pretty happy. Uh, I've got to ask you, I've always been fascinated, uh, is the waiting room, um, the very interesting number from, from The Lamb. I mean, what was that like to re actually record? Well, it wasn't as good as the original when we first did it. We improvised it. We did it. We decided on that. We had a three or four moments where we just improvised um that was one of them and there's another called in the rapid i don't know what they're called and we gave them various times victory at sea it was called something else at the time silence on empty boats bits like that where we just said right we've got setting up a mood and we'll just improvise and we actually tried to improvise on the record which we sort of did and edited it down but when we did a rehearsal the, the waiting room we just said let's scare ourselves you know and we did it in this spooky old house that was owned by led zeppelin called headley grange That's right. um and it was, you know, I don't know, I feel the thunder and lightning. There probably wasn't. <laughs> I'm adding that. But it was definitely quite spooky. It was sort of twilight. And we sat there. And we actually, you know, particularly Steve was pretty good at doing this kind of making weird noises. And I had all this stuff to make weird noises too. And it was actually, we really scared ourselves, I think, that first time. And it was sort of really going like that. And then, then at some point, Mike, who was perhaps always the most likely to do it, mm -hmm. started playing something um, more positive. And then we kind of all joined in with that. And the transformation from the um, the spooky to the, you know, to what you might call the very uplifting stuff was very, it was a, a fantastic moment. Anyhow, we tried to recapture this on the record. I think, you know, we sometimes came, we sort of, I don't know, bits of it were close, but not, not really. We didn't get the effect. We used the same sort of sounds, but not, it's a difficult thing to recreate, I suppose. And, um, but I think we wanted to do that. And, and there was, you know, perhaps one of the better ones of those same improvisations became uh, Fly on a Windshield, um, the the sort of that, you know, that grand sound where we tried to sort of imitate kind of pharaohs uh, marching along. I don't know how we, Egyptian, I think it was what we called it or something. Yeah. Um, and again, that was improvised, but with just the idea of having that chord changed at the end, you know. Um, and it's quite exciting to do that for us because we were quite a sort of, uh, you know, we tended to like to, have everything very organized you know all, yeah. was, all the solos tended to be written created and stuff by both me and steve and um it was quite nice just to occasionally let yourself go and see what happened yeah it's interesting you mentioned headley grange of course uh steve hackett has said that he uh experienced some ghostly goings on while he was there i just wonder if have you uh experienced anything that could be deemed supernatural while you were there no just just rats <laughs> the, the rats kind of had their home you had them scurrying around all night and then in the more, you know, if you stood when we were outside, you could see them. They did use, there was a kind of great big wisteria that took over on one side of the house. 
and they would just be running up and down the, the things, you know, going through holes and coming out and <laughs> putting out their milk bottles or for empties. You know, they they lived there. Um, it was yeah, it was quite a spooky sort of place, I suppose. I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't think I ever saw a ghost or anything. I was, um, but I it was, you know, I think the the waiting room we mentioned there. I think the atmosphere of that was helped definitely by the house, you know. And I think it yeah. was a it was a strange time for us that a little bit with Peter being a bit sort of a come and go, you know. Um, mm -hmm. wasn't the happiest of times, but uh, I think you know we pretty. It was a it was quite interesting writing period. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the Trespass album has often been referred to as Pastoral Prague. Uh, do you feel that the knife altered the mood and atmosphere of that album from being shook it from its kind of Cros Crosby, Sills and Nash vibe? Well, that was sort of the idea of the cover, I suppose. We had the, you know, the idea that it was quite sort of pretty, pretty stuff, you know, which was kind of what we, we'd been doing uh, quite a bit of, particularly with things like White Mountain and Dusk and everything. Um, and stagnation which is probably the, in many ways this i feel the standout track on the album in many ways but that was sort of um in the acoustic sort of as you say airy fairy sort of stuff and then we had the knife in particular and to some extent looking for someone kind of were really against that and it was quite an important factor i think we didn't want to just be a sort of like a you know fairies in the garden type group really i think <laughs> is probably the truth of the matter and and we had this aggressive element that we really liked we had this song which was always a you know it was very ended up being a very strong live song and everything you know all the headbangers were going you know um and uh so that was the thing that so the album cover had this you know, the pastoral scene slashed by this knife and that that kind of represented the band i think so we had these two sides to us which we always had was it true that the the knife was actually going to be called the nice as a tribute to Keith Emerson, or have I read that incorrectly? Well, no, the working title was the nice. It was never right. going to be called the nice, <laughs> right? right. Um, because it was it was that sort of the bouncy sort of you know organ uh, riff at the front and everything was a bit like sort of uh, Emerson uh, in things like Rondo and stuff like that. So it's just sort of you know it was just a starting point really. We'd. Peter and I had gone to see the Nice uh, a couple of times back. It was about the first show I ever saw, and I, I just thought it was stunning. Um, it was so exciting. It was the first time I'd ever thought about playing live. Actually, I'd never never thought about it before, and I thought this you not know, I was ever, never going to be Keith Emerson. I knew that, but it was just some of the excitement of the sound and, and everything was 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 it was really great. And I think that set us. Uh, it was a very important thing set us on the road. You know. Oh, well, I mean, certainly by the early eighties. Uh, 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 the, there was this kind of revival, neo prog, I think they call it. I mean, did you, um, when a band like Marillion first appeared, do you feel that there was too much similarity between, say, their piece Grendel and Supper's Ready? Well, I didn't really sort of, I honestly hadn't listened to much of them until I just was so, you know, the idea of working with Fish came up and I listened a bit to some of the stuff and I thought, well, it is, there's a couple of moments in that which is pretty, pretty similar. But I mean, yeah, that's flattery. So who cares? You know, it, it's, mm -hmm. It's good. I, I I don't. I think it was all right. I mean, they did something different with with what they with the starting blocks, if you like. And um, you know, I really enjoyed working with Fish. Anyhow, I mean, he's he's a, he's a marvelous chap, and that was all. It was a lot of fun. And and it's, it's curious because his voice, although the resultant effect was quite similar to Peter, the way he got there was completely different because Peter yeah. um, has a much well with fish very much had to sort of feel the, the, the melody and when i was writing melodies from i had to be quite careful i did it because not everything would work whereas with pete would try anything um he, he liked to have a, a, his you know certain melody lines he preferred to do but he he would could do anything so it was a sort of different approach really um and uh but i mean having said that i mean i think I mean, as i mentioned i did two or three songs with fish so i think they work really well because his voice is very it's got a very powerful voice yeah yeah uh, i have a couple of questions from my my patrons really um uh stephen newbold asks uh which three genesis tracks does he consider to have his best performance best performances are, are you most satisfied with golly uh well it's a bit out of the blue really i mean i think well I, i've always loved uh, supper's ready particularly the um the apocalypse of nine eight it was sort of such an exciting piece on stage it sort of worked really well you know starting off fairly kind of lightweight and this interesting more and more menace as you went through and then the big chord you know which everything leads up to the big c major chord um and then Pete singing 666 and i just think that the way it was set up and the way it climaxed there and then the piece that came after it you know um which was uh you know i was a piece of played on guitar i wrote on guitar in fact the bit at the end mm -hmm. um and uh but i didn't on the album i played on keyboards obviously mm -hmm. Was uh, so I love all that, 
what else? Um, well, the Firth of Fifth, I, mean, I can't really get past that. I suppose the opening of Firth of Fifth, I was, you know, it sort of happened. It worked well. I, mean, I just mm. was playing and then that sort of became a, became a kind of result. Although I think the best part of the song is the guitar solo, which is a melody I wrote, but I obviously I didn't play it. So that's not really my performance in a way. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, what? I mean, cinema show is okay, but I think the, the solo could have been better. I always felt that. Um, in later years, you know, this, this, ooh, I, I'll, I would just think it must be something from the later period. I can't think of anything at all. I mean, I love Fading Lights, of course. That's, you know, I, I like the keyboard solo on that very much, but I don't think it's necessarily the, the, the one of the best. But, it, you know, but when you got to the later stages, you know, you could kind of hone things, affect, uh, perfect things a little bit more because the nature of studios and stuff, you know, the ability to drop in and out and do stuff, you know, meant you could you could get a, a sort of more perfect result. But there's, mm. those early days of going in there, all of us trying to get the song right at the same time. I mean, Giant Hogweed, you know, I remember doing it on take 21. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, was the only, it was the first take actually, the, the drums were totally right on. So we had to use <laughs> because everything else was sort of just about right. Uh, the rest of us, I was a bit past it by then. So I, I liked the idea of being able to kind of build songs up, uh, you know, more slowly rather than um, sort of doing it all at the same time. I mean, there's excitement about that, but when you're doing a complex song for the first time, which is the case in many of those things, it you did need a bit of, bit of help. Yes, and uh, Jamie Forstenberg asks, uh, do you regret calling all stations? Uh, uh, do you wish perhaps it had been done differently? I don't really regret it. I mean, I, I don't think it's, you know, I think it was a, it ended up a little bit sort of, I don't think it was, it's it's our best by any means, but it's got some good moments on it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I When I, we got together, Mike and I originally also started writing that album, just the two of us. And I think the problem was a little bit, we tried to write it like we'd done with Phil being there, but Phil wasn't there. And it meant mm -hmm. that we had just the two of us. So rather than having one person laying down something and the other two being able to sort of float about on top of it, which is how we did in the previous ones, it meant we were, one person was holding it down and the other person was trying to do something on top of it. Um, I, I wanted to do, which Mike wasn't so in favour of, perhaps doing one or two songs where which were in more individually written. You know, we could come in and a, do a version of some, you know, do an arrangement of the other person's song and stuff. And I think that might have improved a little bit. Um, but beyond that, I think there's some you know, good moments. I mean, I think uh, there must be some other way. I think we'll really use uh, Ray's voice really well. And it's, it's got an interesting um, keep, you know, interesting uh, instrumental break in it and everything like that. And the first half of One Man's Fool, I really liked too. I just, it was quite, you know, I, th I thought it was interesting lyrically. Um, it kind of curiously seems to sort of, uh, you know, it was written obviously about five years before um, the, the Twin Towers and stuff. And it sounds like you're talking about it. You know, mm -hmm. I was actually writing about the bomb in Manchester when I wrote that lyric, but it was a similar kind of effect. Um, the second half doesn't really work very well, but the first half I thought was really quite, quite a good piece of music. Yeah, so it's good, good bits and, and, and you know, some bits not quite so good. The Congo was perhaps a little disappointing. It sort of it could have been great, but perhaps wasn't, you know. Yeah. Um, do you know if there are any plan sort of remixes or in-depth archival releases planned for the Genesis back catalogue in along the vein of what see Jethro Tull are doing at the moment? The only things that are happening really tend to be slightly sort of from other people. I mean, obviously the Genesis Revelation era, uh, Esoteric, I know, are um, doing bits and pieces. I've heard some of them have you know, gone back to the original tapes as much as they can. It's quite mm -hmm. difficult because they're all pre-mixed really, but uh, a couple of things sound really good on that, actually. I think I mean, I, some, some good songs on there. Um, and I know the Lamb, sort of the 50th anniversary of the Lamb, sort of there could be a, I don't know, there's a, there's a possibility of some mix. This Atmos thing, I don't even come across this yet, which is mm -hmm. a system that nobody has. So yeah. very pointless to me to do a mix for it. But anyhow, there's some possibility of doing that. Um, I know Peter's quite keen, and and I've heard a couple of things, and and we we're sort of going to progress a little bit with that, I think, as a possible different thing. But the I think the idea of putting out all the Lamb stuff in one go with the um, we, we discovered, I think, that the final, when we did the live version of The Lamb on one of the archive albums, um, it, we had to compromise. I think it was was a version of the studio version. We actually found, I think, a live version of that now and of the encores we did on that day, um, which, but I think they're, they're like board tapes, so they are a bit rough, but mm -hmm. I mean, real fans may well like that. Uh, it's got all the right. You think they might all be collated in a lamb box set? Yeah, I think they're going for some sort of lamb box set. I mean, you know, as I said, it was, the idea was originally to do it as a, as a 50th anniversary. Well, it is looking it might be the 60th anniversary. <laughs> I can't believe it's all 50 years ago, but that's what it, no, it was. So there you go.
Yeah. Uh, my last question is, uh, would you consider um, uh, a touring, perhaps um, presenting sort of instrumental pieces from your, your Genesis career and perhaps your uh, some of the classical pieces you've done? Um, I, I, I never have a plan really of doing this. I don't feel very happy being the front man on, on any kind of stage situation. I've hidden, I spent all my life hiding behind sort of uh, first of all picture and then Phil, thank God they were good at it, you know. Um, and uh, so I have never thought about it. I know Steve does, does a good job and he, that, that, that works great for him, but um, not particularly doing that. I, I never say I'd never do anything. I don't really know. I'd, I'd love for some of these orchestral pieces to be done live. But I'd rather someone else did it. You know what I mean? It's kind mm -hmm. of like, um, I think, to slot one of these pieces in, in a sort of bigger program, you know, uh, where they're playing more pieces that everybody knows, if you like, it would be nice. Because um, I think they could stand up in that situation. But and one or two of them have been played by smaller smaller combos, uh, uh, particularly Black Down from, um, from Seven has been, you know, played a few times and things. And obviously, I, the original, uh, the first piece on five, which is probably two million years, I originally wrote, commissioned to do that. And it was played live at, at the Cheltenham Music Festival. Uh, not mm -hmm. spectacularly, but it was played there, which was nice to have that uh, done, you know. So I think the, it would be nice to have a bit more of that. But it's quite difficult to get, you know, the, the classical world is quite a closed shop, really. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, as you pointed out earlier, they, they're not too keen on people from the rock world. <laughs> I mean, you do have a problem a little bit with this kind of music that, that that's, you know, it's got no drums. So a lot of the rock guys are not very interested in it. And then the classical guys don't like it because it's me. Um, <laughs> but you, know, you hope to sort of break through that a little bit. And some people have done it a bit, but there's, there's no, there's always that slight element, isn't there? I mean, that I, I know there is, because even when I, I have the feeling about other people who do it, you know, even when Paul McCartney did his thing or whatever, or when John Law did his thing, you kind of, just, it's in the back of your mind, you know, you think, oh, this is a rock guy doing pop, classical music or orchestral music. Is that right? You know, don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Uh, well, I said that. My stuff, great. Right, okay. Just, just want to point that out. Sorry. I just I want to say that. Mine, mine's worth listening to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me just plug this box set again. This is Tony Banks' 18 Pieces for Orchestra. Uh, this is available to purchase now. There is a purchasing link just below this video. Please do check it out. Uh, Tony, thank you so much for your time this evening. Um, um, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. All right. Well, thank you very much. That's great. Okay. My pleasure. All the best, mate. Bye-bye. Okay. okay bye.